السلام علیکم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم All praises are Allah's Lord of the worlds and may his peace and blessings be upon our master the holy prophet Muhammad and his pure immaculate and pure bait. I've really enjoyed the presence of this very warm community during the last few nights and I mean that from the bottom of my heart it was, very, it was a very warm and delightful experience for me firstly in the presence of my dear brother Sheikh Ahmad Modaris but also the recitations before my speech the voices of Mr. Hamkar Mr. Qobadi, Mr. Mir Ahmad Shah, Yahya Ansari um, Hosseini, they really, it really had a very positive effect upon me personally. It really created an environment for me before coming on the pulpit, and I'm very grateful. And the quality of their recitations and the content was very enriched. If only they may be conveyed into English a bit more so that the youth can really benefit from what the senior members of this community are reciting. It may be of benefit. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Chapter 29, verse 64. وَمَا هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَحْوٌ وَلَعِبٌ وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ لَحِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ This worldly life is nothing but diversion and amusement. Real life, according to the Holy Quran, is in the hereafter. Our aim in this world is to acquire this life that we termed Hayatun Tayyabe in this world we want to acquire it, be granted it in order to continue and spiritually elevate in the hereafter now where we ended off last night was the prerequisites of acquiring this Hayatun Tayyabe is to execute righteous acts, actions whilst being free of lahw, la'ib, and dunya. Whenever we execute righteous actions, they have to be lahw free, diversion free, diversion from Allah, amusement free, dunya free. Now, inshallah, we're going to explore these terms in more detail. But these three, diversion, amusement, and the dunya, have no external existence. Let me start off by saying this. The dunya, the translation for dunya, is not world. That's not very precise. This external world that we have in the Quran is referred to Samawatu wal Ard, the heavens and the earth, the external world, is always referred to in the Quran as Samawat and Ard. The external world isn't referred to as Dunya, because Dunya is reproached in Islam. However, the external world, whatever is, of course it's not reproached. Whatever exists in the external world, it's all grace. It's all blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this dunya is referring to another reality. There is no dunya in the external world. 
The dunya is within. It doesn't exist in the external world. Lah occurs within. It doesn't happen outside in the external world. Laib occurs within, not outside. On eliminating these three elements when committing righteous actions, only then one becomes alive and be granted that Hayatun Tayyibe. Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam has said, Asharro kamilun fi kulli ahad. Evil is perfect, is complete in every one of us. There's evil in all of us. In qalabahu batan. If that evil predominates over you, it'll become ingrained. وَإِنْ لَمْ يَغْلِبْهُ ذَهَرْ If it doesn't pre predominate over you, within, it'll fade away. If you're predominated by لَهُ and لَعِب and remain in the realm of death, remember how we defined the mayyit last night, Those who are drowned in diversion and amusement are still dead. They're living in this world, but they're termed dead according to the logic of the Holy Quran. If this is the case, with you being confined in the realm of death, your existence is full of evil. Evil is predominating inside. But eliminating la, eliminating la'ib, eliminating the dunya within, will eliminate that evil. And I'll, I'll speak more on this in a minute. However, in general, your family, your children, your nice car, your large house, the power that you have, all these, none of these are la, none of these are la'ib, and none of these are dunya. They're all blessings, they're all good. None of these things, your car, your house, your family, none of them require refining. They're all good. These are all Allah's blessings. It's only your take and your understanding and how you associate with the car, with the house, with your family, with your job. That's the dunya. That can constitute la'ib and lahu. That can be diversion and that needs refining not the actual house, or the family, or the job, and so on and so forth. The refining must be realized within. It must be internally tuned. Your take on the car, on the house, on university, at the workplace, the family, children. Your take on these things have to be internally tuned. Al-Qalbu Haramullah The heart is Allah's sanctuary Wa la tuskin Haramallah Ghayr Allah Don't let other than Allah reside in Allah's sanctuary Don't let other than Allah reside within you it's this other than Allah, it's this ghayr Allah that we create within ourselves. And it's this inner creation that is tantamount to lahaw, la'ib and dunya. 
It's all your own creation. You're creating all these things within. It's very difficult to refine oneself from matters of the dunya. Prophet Esau alayhi salam was revealed two instructions to help one to succeed in refining oneself and not to create that lahwan laib and dunya within. It was revealed to Prophet Esau alayhi salam man aslaha ma baynahu wa bayna Allah. Whoever corrects oneself, corrects or refines one's relationship between oneself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aslah Allah, Allah will refine. Ma baynahu wa bayna nas. Allah will refine that association between you and people. Because people, they're all good. Your take on people can create that inner dunya. That lah. But if you correct that relationship between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, primarily through the Sharia, Allah will correct your association with the people, will refine it for you. Waman aslaha amra akhirate, and whoever refines one's matters of the hereafter, aslaha Allah. Amra dunya. Allah will refine matters of the dunya for him. There are two things you have to refine your relationship with Allah, faith in Allah, and Amra akhira, recalling the hereafter. If you have a possess proper faith in relation to Allah and recall the hereafter, your take on the external blessings of Allah will be refined. And if that take is refined, you won't be creating that inner lahawa, that inner la'ib, that inner dunya anymore. And that leads to Hayatun Tayyibe. Because you're now la free, la'ib free, dunya free. But if Ghayr Allah, other than Allah, enters the hearts from outside, from the external world, although the external world is all good, but your take on it is polluting you. And I'll explain what I mean by one's take on the external world. But it's that negative take that one understands and associates and attributes to the external blessings that is creating that inner dunya. Now this is what I mean. This external world includes ch your children, family, friends, job, examinations, university, car, house, clothes, everything. And they're all good. They're all grace from Allah. They're all blessings from Allah. It's how you associate with these things. You, it's how you attribute your children to yourself. This is my child. You take this statement too literally. You really think it's your child when you, sh you should believe this is Allah's. You don't own anything. You're nothing. It's my car, my job. I passed my examinations. I did this. It's these negative associations you make with the outside world, these negative attributings to yourself 
is creating that inner dunya, is diverting you from Allah. It's all a game. Your whole life thinking that this is my child, my family, my job, my car, it's all la diversion and it's all la'ib. It's all a game. After 60, 70, 80 years, you've just undergone everything in this world was a game to you. You were constantly diverted from Allah. Why? Because of what you created by means of those associations, that negative take on what is what are blessings from Allah. But you took it the wrong way. You created distractions, diversions from Allah by means of your negative take on the family, children, job, university, car, house, and so on and so forth. It was all your imagination playing around with you, your takhayyul. You imagined this was your child, your job, your car and you attached yourself to it. You created that غير Allah within. Because in reality, nothing is yours. فَإِنَّ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ Everything is Allah's. You took it the wrong way. So the inside requires purifying. Not the outside. Whatever exists on the outside is it's all grace. It's all blessings. Your imagination requires tuning, requires harmonizing. One may have taqwa. Do the, all the wajibat. Refrain from all the muharramat, but lack these inner refinements. One can have taqwa, but be attached to, negat negat be negatively attached to, let's say, one's house, one's children, one's job. But he does all the wajibat and refrains, refrains from all the muharramat. He's also playing. It's all a game. Taqwa was a preliminary step to perfection. It's not perfection per se. It's a first step. You can't be your own waris if you've created that inner lah and la'ib. You have to be lah free, la'ib free to acquire that hayatun tayyibi waj al ho and oh Allah assign that hayat as our varis in the hereafter in order for you to continue and to spiritually elevate in barzakh and in the hereafter so this tahayyul this imagination these imaginative associations that you build within the collective sum is called the dunya, the collective sum of these associations and attributings. This tahayyul requires monitoring, requires scrutinizing, harmonizing. One has to monitor oneself how one is viewing the surrounding world. And while you're viewing it in that light, you have to view it in a way that you become lah free. It doesn't divert you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why muraqibe, that scrutinizing of one's actions from action to action on an action to action basis, that's why it's essential. The objective of muraqibe self-scrutiny is to refine these imaginations of ours 
if one improperly attributes the external things around oneself, you know, my child, my work, my car, my job, this and that, it's a means to laha. If one improperly attributes one's actions around oneself, when the ego comes in, that's a distraction from Allah too. You're praying, but that praying, although it's on a par with taqwa, although it's wajib, but even that praying can be a distraction from Allah. And it means to laugh. All actions. Now there's a way to use and employ the external blessings and one's own actions so that one remains clear from the realm of Lahawa. That's the aim here. To be granted Hayatun Tayyabe in this world and to take it with us to the hereafter. It's important to stay away from the realm of Lahawa, diversion from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all talk with our friends. We all bathe. We all walk. We all eat. We all sleep. Socialize. Listen. Clothe. Comb. Go to picnics. But it's all la and la eb. Unless you internally tune yourself. When you talk, is Allah in the equation at all? Are you in the presence of Allah? Or are you totally oblivious to Allah when you're talking to your friend? When you eat, when you bathe, when you clothe yourself, comb your hair, go to the picnic, all these are good. Wear good clothes, have a big house, eat well, speak well, go to the picnic, have a good time. But if Allah exits the equation in all these actions, you're bound in the realm of la. What can one do to do all these actions but not be diverted from Allah? We have to make sure that when we do all these actions, it's not all la'ib, all just an amusement. The result is la'ib when there's no Allah in the equation. You eat, not being in the presence of Allah, not appreciating it. You socialize, not appreciating your presence before Allah. You go to the picnic, not appreciating your presence before Allah. This is all a game. You're just adding and adding and enhancing your inner dunya, and that's reproached because it's Allahless. But this need not be the case. We can do all these things and have a marvelous time without it leading us to enter and be bound by the realm of Lah. But what is it that needs tuning exactly? And the answer is one's niya, one's intention. This muraqibah is a function of one's niya. Al-a'malu bin niyat. It's the niya, the intention that mediates, tunes, and harmonizes one's takhayyul one's imagination in association with the external blessings. A moderated takhayol will keep one safe from the realm of la. It has to be moderated though. 
you shouldn't let the tachayul get out of hand with its negative associations in relation to the car, the food, and so on and so forth. If it does get out of hand, the result is la, la'ib, and dunya. And you intended it, and you created it. And you'll be resurrected with it in the hereafter. Why? Because instead of saying lahu ma fis samawati wal ard, whatever's in the earth and the heavens is Allah's. You kept on attaching yourself to your children as if they're really yours. That attachment is negative. Love your children, but don't regard them as you, you, your children. Don't get drowned in that link. Don't get drowned in that association, that mental association. Don't attribute your children to you alone. They're Allah's. Honor and prestige are good. As long as you believe in al izzatu lillah jami'a. All honor is Allah's. Honor and power, prestige, they're all good. But the, as soon as you believe that you acquired and you have this prestige and you're powerful it's yours as long as from the time this enters the mind from the time this imagination is realized there you go down for you're in the realm of lah you're diverted from Allah but be powerful be prestigious but regard it all as Allah's This belief in faith plus khiyal-free actions leads to you being granted hayatun tayyibah. Man amila saliha, whoever does righteous actions. Min dhakarin o untha, be you male or female. Wa huwa mu'min. Whilst having faith in Allah and recalling the hereafter, only then will most certainly grant them that hayatun tayyibe. They do righteous actions whilst having faith in Allah and recalling the hereafter. Righteous actions that are dunya free. Lahaw free. Ma hadhi al hayat al dunya illa lahaw. Wal laib. But you have to act. Lahaw free. Laib free. This hayat al dunya, the world of life, is the collective sum of all these negative imaginative links you're making with the external blessings. You have to be free from them. Whilst being a mu'min, then you'll be granted hayatun tayyibah. This collective sum of these attributings, this is the dunya. And it's this that is reproached. So in short, this dunya that is reproached is born and bred within a vessel and the vessel is our imagination. How the imagination plays around with us. This is mine, I achieved this, I did that. These are all traces of the ego. Otherwise we're, we're a nobody. We shouldn't let the ego grow within. It's our imagination that is allowing and creating this negative dunya. Mutu qabla an tamutu. Kill the dunya, die. Kill the dunya within that you've created for yourself. Kill all traces of the ego before you actually die. Free the eye, free the eye from these negative associations that you're making. Chapter 4, verse 100. 
مَيَّخْرُجْ مِنْ بَيْتِهِ مُهَاجِرًا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Whoever exits one's house whilst emigrating towards Allah and Allah's Messenger ثُمَّ يُدْرِكُهُ الْمَوْتِ Then death overtakes them فَقَدْ وَقَعَ أَجْرُهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ their reward is upon Allah. They'll get rewarded by Allah. The external meaning of this is evident. Those who are in lands of oppression, they want to leave their lands. Well, this doesn't apply to you. Alhamdulillah, everyone can live a very safe Islamic life in America. You don't. Okay, there are some problems, but on the whole, you can live very safe lives here and practice your Islam. In England, one can lead even a more Islamic life there because they're more free in England than you. We're very free in England. As Muslims in England, we can lead marvelous Islamic lives. There's no prohibition. Much better than many countries in the Middle East. Anyway, but assume there's a land of oppression and you want to flee it because your deen, your religion is under attack. Those who do flee, emigrating towards Allah and the Messenger of Allah, to practice religion in another land, Allah's laws, the laws of the Messenger, and then death overtakes them on this route, they will be rewarded by Allah. Now Imam Khomeini, touches upon an esoteric dimension of this verse. He says, maybe, because with esoteric dimensions, only the ma'asum can give it. And the ma'asum, we don't have anything recorded from the ma'asum esoterically on this verse. There are many verses where the butun, the esoteric dimensions, are demonstrated by the ma'asum. But we don't have the esoteric, esoteric dimensions to all verses. Although we are told by the Matsum that all verses have butun, esoteric dimensions. Even some traditions say that each verse has 70 esoteric dimensions. But if we don't have traditions that highlight those esoteric dimensions, it's okay to pontificate and deliberate, but you always have to say, maybe this is an esoteric dimension. Whoever reads through Imam Khomeini's books, he always says, where a ma'asum hasn't related something esoterically, he always says, maybe this is an esoteric dimension of this verse. It's okay to deliberate, it's not problematic. On this verse, Imam Khomeini offers a possible suggestion of an esoteric dimension of this verse. Mayakhruj min baytihi. This bait has been used by the Ma'sumin as the ego in other verses of the Quran. But not here. Imam Khomeini says, whoever exits one's ego whilst traveling spiritual wayfaring towards Allah thumma yudrik hulmaut then death overtakes them they manage by means of exiting the realm of the ego to slaughter all traces of the ego within they eliminate all traces of the ego, the ego being those negative, imaginative associations one makes in this world. They've killed themselves. Mutu qabla an tamutu. They've eliminated all traces of the ego. Faqad waqa'a ajruhu ala Allah. Their reward will be upon Allah. Now I want to go through a sto one of the stories of the Holy Quran. Ayatollah Hassan Zadeh and many other scholars are of the belief that all the stories we read in the Holy Quran, there's 
there's one ultimate objective behind them and that's how to eliminate the ego how to eliminate غير Allah in order to be able to in quotes see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala otherwise the Quran is not a book of history okay it has an external meaning and we all accept the external meaning but it has esoteric dimensions to it many scholars especially Ayatollah Hassan Zadeh Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli they believe that the objective behind these stories is to teach us how to eliminate traces of the ego it has an external meaning which we all accept there is a third dimension to it which has been referred in traditions of the Matsumi is in relation to how to eliminate one's ego, how to kill the ego in order to be a stronger manifestation of Allah's attributes. وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّي O oh Allah, Prophet Ibrahim said to Allah, show me how you revive the dead. Now, this is Prophet Ibrahim speaking. He has El Yarim already. In chapter 2, 258, Rabbi al He believes in his Lord. He has El Yarim. He had Ainul Yameen too. Chapter 6, verse 75. وَكَذَا لِكَنُّهِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ بَلَكُوتُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَبَعَدْ وَلِيَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُغْنِينَ Very good. We showed Ibrahim the dominions of the heavens and the earth so that he can be one of those who has Yameen. He already had Ilmul Yameen. He acquired Ainul Yamin too, according to this verse. A strong level of Yamin. But here, according to Ayatollah Jawadi, he's asking for Hakul Yamin to be a manifestation of the attribute more Yi. So Allah, show me how you revive the dead. And you all know the story of the four birds, where he was told to destroy them, cut them into pieces, put them on mountain peaks, call upon them, and they all came. But esoterically, this reviving of the dead, Mohi, one who gives Hayat to the dead. Who are the dead? Those who are within the realm of <laughs> How to revive the heart, the soul, the spirit. How to grant it Hayotun Tayyabe. Ola Awalam told me, I was said, why don't you believe? Ola Bala, yes I do. Well, uh, it's a quiet and tranquility of the heart that he had for Yadin, which he didn't have. Then the protocol comes, the esoteric protocol of how to acquire Hakkul Yadin, how to destroy all traces of the ego in order to be manifestations of Allah's attributes. Although in relation to us it's one degree, in relation to us it's a very higher degree. I mean, we should compare ourselves. But the protocol given is for our benefit. Take four birds, destroy them, this word isn't the correct translation, it's used. The correct 
translation is to domesticate them, but then I would have to explain what domesticating means here, and that will take time. But some people do use destroy them into pieces, but Matula Jawadi has a problem with this term. But we'll use it for these purposes here. Destroy them. And put a bit of each on each mountain peak. The tradition say there were ten mountain peaks there. Thumad ohunna, call upon them. Yakti neke, sakya, they'll come hastily towards you. The four birds were the peacock, the duck, the vulture, and the craven. These four are known for specific vicious attributes. If you kill these attributes within, you will revive the heart. You'll be able to disassociate from Ghayr al You'll be able to exit the realm of Lah and Lahir. What are those vicious attributes? The peacock is known for its love of beauty, love of the ego. That negative imagination, that I am this, I am pretty, I am beautiful, I am this. And so seeing Allah as the source of beauty. The more you love yourself, you're creating that inner dunya. You're being diverted, you're just playing in this world. The duck, since it eats dead flesh and everything, it's, dead. it's referred to as having a love for materialism. Your love, your attachment to the material world diverts you from Allah. That collective, some of these negative links that you're making with the material world. It's all la, la em. The vulture is known for its lengthy desires. You know how it waits for its prey to uh, rot or begin to die, then it comes. It waits for long periods of time. It's known for its lengthy desires. These lengthy desires, when one acquires them, the more lengthy they become, and not gradually exits the equation slowly. The more lengthy the desires, if one doesn't take care, it will distance one from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The craven is known for its nutritional appetite. Food is good, but you have to control it. Now some traditions use the rooster instead of the vulture. And the rooster is known for its sexual appetite. Which is okay, but it has to be controlled. If it exits the norm, that can be, be, be diverted from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It can be a source to la'ib, la'ha. You kill these vicious attributes within or control them, your heart will be revived. Because by killing these attributes, you're killing the ego. And then you can be a manifestation of Allah's attributes and in quotes, see Allah upon the top. Chapter 76, verse 21. Their Lord will give them a pure drink. And Musadir and Islam said, this shalom, this drink, this pure drink, is a heavenly drink which cleanses one from other than Allah, from Muslim Allah. It's in heaven, but we must drink it here in order to be bestowed it in heaven. We have to cleanse ourselves from Muslim Allah here in this world to be given this drink. In the whole of Quran, maybe 90 plus percent of heaven is described with materialistic 
recreational pleasures. The holies, the rivers, the food, the palaces, just a minute. These are heaven's materialistic pleasures. It's, the, it's a minimum. And those who have taqwa, which is the minimum, will be given these materialistic pleasures. But we want something much higher than these materialistic pleasures. We want that spiritual heaven. That can only be acquired here. And you take it with yourself to the hereafter. Don't expect to be granted the spiritual heaven in the hereafter. All spiritual perfections, if you want to have them in heaven, they have to be acquired in this world. For some people entering heaven, they won't suffice with the palaces, with the food, with these recreations. They want something much more. They want to be besides the Ahlul Bayt and go higher and higher, but that has to be acquired in this world. You have to manage to have that association with the Ahlul Bayt here and take that association with you to the hereafter. Whatever perfection resides in heaven is transferred there via you from the dunya. As the Gnostics say, all perfections are iktisabi and intaqali. They're all earned and acquired in this world and they're all transferred and conveyed with you to the hereafter. The same applies to the heaven and hell of Barzakh. We must acquire this heavenly Barzakh here and take it with us to Barzakh. During the life in this world, if you don't get to possess or acquire these heavenly and spiritual perfections, the result is you won't acquire them in Barzakh or in Piyama. You may enter Barzakh or Qiyamah's heaven because you had taqwa, which was a minimum. You may enter it, but you'll only be given those recreational things. You won't be given those perfections because you didn't acquire those perfections in this world. Taqwa was a root to perfection. It wasn't perfection per se. Those inner refinements are necessary to exit the realm of la of lake. You can have tapwa but still be dead. So spiritual elevation can only be taken from the external world here. Now assuming you succeed with executing all the Lord you want and refraining from the Muhammad and then leave in such a state you may still be static in Barzakh. It's very possible. That what per se isn't a guarantee, isn't all the way yet. Isn't a guarantee of you exiting the realm of La the realm of Lahim. You may have Taqwa, but be full of those negative associations we were talking about. And you'll be static in Barzakh. And if you do enter, it's heaven, it's only with those materialistic pleasures. As one of Stolten Bohm said, when you enter Yoma, you'll be said, this is your heavenly stable. It's not an honor to be with the Huris or with the palaces, with the food, with the rivers, and so on and so forth. Your honor, your worth is much higher than this. If you want to execute siyara of the Ahlul Bayt in the hereafter, if you want to, in quotes, see Allah and benefit from Allah in the hereafter, that must be taken from this world. Righteous legacies, the Bogiyot Salat, will have an effect. But that effect isn't in relation to spiritual elevation. 
is what you acquired in this world will be given in the hereafter. And if you have Borea to store the heart, if you're in a bad place in Barzakh, your hardships will be somewhat eliminated or alleviated. If you're in a good place in Barzakh, you'll be given more provisions than you already acquired. That's the extent of Borea to store. That's the benefit. But you want to elevate spiritually. Now one may ask, can one elevate in Barzakh by means of Shafa'a, intercession? Can one elevate in Barzakh the minor Qiyamah? Can one elevate in the major Qiyamah, the day of resurrection onwards, by means of Shafa'a? But first of all, there is no Shafa'a in Barzakh, which is also Qiyamah before the Day of Resurrection. It's called the minor Qiyama in the traditions. When we die, Qiyama starts, but the Barzakh continues. There's no Shafa'a in Barzakh. Even if you're a Shia, a true, you have true doctrinal beliefs in Shiism, a true lover of Amir al Mu'minin. In Barzakh, you will burn for the bad actions that you did. There's no help there. And that burning is like the burning of the day of resurrection. There's no escape. Those traditions which speak that all the Shias will enter heaven is after the day of resurrection, not Barzakh. The Imams say, We fear for your Barzakh, but in heaven be rest assured. All the Shias of Amir al Mu'minin, who have that true doctrinal belief of Shias, they will all go to heaven. They've had their share in Barzakh, they've, they've burnt in Barzakh, their sins have been cleansed in Barzakh. All that remains is their doctrine. And since they were Shias, they will all go to heaven. But some Muslims, even then, will go to hell before going to heaven. Anyway, is there Shafa'a in Barzakh and in Qiyamah in Barzakh? In the major Qiyamah, there is Shafa'a. But not in relation to spiritual elevation, only in relation to eliminating those hardships. Or pro increasing one's provisions. It's limited. There's no room for spiritual elevation in Qiyamah. Whatever you acquire here, that's what you will acquire in the army. Where Shafara is effective in relation to your spiritual elevation is in this world. That yes, by a Shafara you can acquire spiritual elevation, perfection in this world, and then take it with you to the hereafter. Everything is in this world. In Barzakh, you can't acquire spirituality. <coughs> the expression isn't very polite, but I've heard it used by many scholars. They say, there's no Allah in Barzakh. There's no Allah in the Qiyama. What they mean is, when you enter Barzakh and when you go to Qiyama, don't ask for Allah's assistance in relation to your spiritual elevation. That had to be acquired in this world. Chapter 17, verse 72, وَمَنْ كَانَ فِي هَذِهِ Those who are blind in this world, فَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ أَعْمَى They were blind in the hereafter. If you're blind spiritually in this world, you've gained nothing. This blindness will be embodied in the hereafter and you're blind there. If you want not to be blind in the hereafter, you have to acquire perfection in this world. Take it with you. Your perfection will be embodied in the hereafter. Everything happens here. You must, forgive the expression again, 
take along with you to the bazaar. Or as some scholars say, if you want to go to Mecca from Simi Valley, you have to take Mecca with you to Mecca. If you're not ready inside, go to Mecca or go then just come back and at least you're you turn the haji according to fit and you've done that wajib. You want much more. You have to raise your objectives. Okay, I think I'll end here. Thank you for being very patient these last few days. Although I don't want to cause any despair with these discussions. If there's one thing I want to convey, is at least try, at least try to be on the route to perfection, even if you never acquire it. But strive to be on the path. Make an effort, endeavor, spend some time, deliberate. As long as Allah sees you striving on the path, He will then cause that perfection gradually, inshallah. But just make sure you don't fall off the path. Okay. Once again, I thank everyone for their patience. And uh, inshallah, we'll see one another, inshallah, in the near future. Assalamu alaikum wa wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.